And welcome back to This Week. Time now to get the views of our media and political experts, Nashville Democratic State Representative Brenda Gilmore mm -hmm. and her daily on 1510 WLAC syndicated talk show host, Steve Gill. Welcome. Nice to see you both. Thank you. It's good to be here. Let's talk a little bit about the governor and his class size proposal. And I guess we talked a little bit about this and you beat me to the punch. My question is, who is advising him? How is he coming to a conclusion that is so wrong that even his own party can't support the proposal that would you know, change the fund, tie funding to raising classrooms, and he had to back off big time. And I know the Democrats are appreciative because they don't want this to happen. Nobody wants bigger classes, but he just really seemed to misread it. Uh, we've heard from teachers all over the state just saying that this is the wrong direction. This is a conversation that we had 15 or 20 mm -hmm. years ago, that we've made a lot of uh, gains in terms of decreasing the size of schooling and classes and for uh, Governor Haslam to come up with this conversation I just it makes no sense and in addition it's a huge expenditure for the counties that they just don't have it's, we see the same thing with domestic violence uh, and I'm very pleased that we're going to be uh, making some improvements then but again we're passing the fees over to the local governments for them to pay and they just don't have the money I think a big part of the problem is back on what we've talked about for a long time with the Haslam administration, and a lot of it is communications, even more than policy. Their pitch on this class size deal <clears throat> is that it really isn't going to change the number of kids per classroom. Mm -hmm. It's how you count it. It's the average. It's how you report it, not the number of kids per classroom. Well, if that's the case, they should have done a much better job defining what they were doing. They didn't do that. I think that's why they got behind the eight ball. And then you've got to change people's minds. That never works. And I think, again, you get back to the Haslam administration may not have really strong positions on policy. They then come out with things and then have to backtrack. But it really gets back down to communications. I think they were surprised a little bit that 80% of school superintendents and some of the own Republicans decided that they can't support this at all, just totally opposed to it. That's right. His own party said no to this. So we see him backing off, and I hope he does just stay permanently away from this. Let's talk about the upcoming presidential primary. It looks like Tennessee, as we talked a little bit about before, too, is, is you know, it's not going to be a deciding factor, but it becomes a player in this. We've got money coming in. We've got candidates coming in. We've got a little bit of excitement about the people that are going to be turning out to vote. May increase voter turnout. All good things for Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we see a trend as anybody but Mitt Romney. <laughs> and uh, in Tennessee, it looks like the people are lining up behind Santorum. We just don't know how that's going to work out. Uh, in the end, it probably will be uh, the governor. But I think that what we see in the trend across the country is that there's just not an excitement there for Mitt Romney. I think there has been a sentiment within the Republican primary process of an anybody but Mitt <laughs> among some circles, but we're going to cure that when we get into the fall. It's going to be anybody but Obama. <laughs> I think the other thing is that you've got <clears throat> Santorum got a big bump in that poll that we saw in Tennessee, and that it was taken immediately after his wins in Missouri, uh, Minnesota, mm -hmm. and Colorado. <clears throat> that gave him an artificial bump. He's not spending money in Tennessee. That bump's going to decline a little bit. So I think Tennessee is still wide open. Tennessee may actually be one of the real battlegrounds of battlegrounds on Super Tuesday, which means you're going to see more money, more, more attention from the candidates. Romney's coming here. Santorum's coming here. Uh, Newt's coming here. So you're going to see a lot of attention in Tennessee, and that's good for Tennessee. Polls show that Santorum is leading in Tennessee. I guess not a big surprise with his conservative Christian background. Mm -hmm. I guess the question is the new dust-up over the contraception, him being opposed to abortion, opposed to, con opposed to contraception that's, that's growing. Mm -hmm. especially with women, obviously. Is this going to hurt him here in Tennessee? I think it will. I think it will especially hurt with females. Uh, I think that a lot of our Catholic uh, community uh, can support him when he says no abortion. But when you go a step further and say no contraceptives, and the polls show that 95% of even Catholic women families use uh, some type of contraceptive, then I think that he's just moved entirely too far to the right. Do you think it hurts him here in Tennessee? No, I don't think it hurts him here in Tennessee. And I think the issue, again, is being misframed. It is not about saying no contraception. It's whether or not the federal government should be able to order religious institutions, organizations, to have to comply with their view of religion rather than their own conscience. And I think he'll win that one, whether it's within Catholic women. The bishop, Bishop Choby in this town, is still adamantly opposed to this policy. I think where you're seeing Santorum get the gain, I think you're seeing some in his national bump. Is it in Michigan, for example, where you're going to see 25 to 30 percent of the voters in Michigan, which go to the mm -hmm. polls on the 28th, are Catholic. So he's getting a big bump in that Catholic base because of this issue. It may not be a Catholic base that he enjoys in Tennessee to give him a surge, but the evangelical vote will also give him some support there as you well. You talk to voters, you talk to people daily, you hear from your constituents. Has this energized people who to get them out to the polls? Think there will be more early voting? Think there will be more people going to the polls on March the 6th because of this? 
I'm not sure that this particular issue drives it, but certainly as you're looking at the fall, you've got the Catholic bishops who are trying to drive 70 million Catholics mm -hmm. to follow their lead on this issue. They are adamantly preaching it from the pulpit. David Choby is, uh, Bishop Choby is also talking about the issue at Vanderbilt where they seem to be taking an anti-Christian religion policy at Vanderbilt. So you've gotten the Catholic base and the Catholic bishops involved. You put that with the evangelicals. Four years ago, 14 million evangelical Christians did not vote. There's an effort to try to make sure 4 million more are registered and 7 million more vote this time. That could change the dynamic. I think that because of this issue that we're going to see more independents move uh, toward President Obama in this discussion because he came up with a wonderful solution where the religious uh, institutions would not have to support any kind of contraceptives. It gave a way out and it still supported women. And uh, for uh, Santorium and other right, far right candidates to continue to use this as a wedge, I think it's a huge mistake. I think the, the big issue that all of us should be focusing in on is jobs and improving the economy and we've seen that the president have come up with a solution and he's ready to move forward and we still see these candidates using this as a wedge issue. I think the problem with the president's accommodation because he doesn't want to call it a, 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 a concession mm -hmm. is that he's saying the insurance companies will pay for this for free. They'll pay for the contraception for free so the institutions don't have to. That's as bogus as his false budget. They are not going to do it for free. There is no such thing as a free lunch and the way they get that calculation is yes, if you kill babies they don't get born and you don't have the cost of that. If you prevent births, you don't have the cost of people. Now we're going to go after older people and kill them because it saves money. That is not a policy that's going to work with anybody that listens. Well, in fact, the insurance companies are, are one of the P, uh, institutions that have come to the president with this solution, so I think it's a wonderful solution. Nationally, the president has proposed a budget which in, does increase the deficit by about a trillion dollars. Uh, Republicans are saying it's dead on arrival. Is this hurting him? This is basically the same budget that got shot down a year ago. I think during this election year is going to be very difficult for us to see anything happen in Washington, <laughs> D.C., no, even if had it been a, a great budget. And I do believe that there are a lot of good components in this budget, especially his jobs bill, which uh, the Republicans have said no, they just don't want to support it all. And in that jobs bill, we see wonderful support for our teachers, for our veterans. And um, so I, I think it just has to do with the election year. 30 seconds. Is this $1.3 trillion dollar budget the president promised four years ago he would cut the deficit in half. This expands it and it increases the tax burden on the American people for generations to come and doesn't produce jobs. Steve Gilbrand, again, we appreciate your time and your insights. Stay with us. This week continues in a moment.